ask Dunga ji to introduce uh, uh, the speaker for for today, and uh, um, also uh, uh, followed up by the welcome address from uh, uh, President uh, Atul Pandey ji of VIA. So, Mr. Dunga ji. everybody ladies and gentlemen it's my great uh, privilege to introduce a very old friend dr bandia first of all let me wish him a very happy birthday which went uh, yesterday i believe he came specially to celebrate the birthday after 32 years am i right that calls for a party uh the dr bandia has been a nagpurian he's born in nagpur he studied in nagpur he wants to give back to nagpur he is at the moment a ceo of a indo canadian uh, consortium called ic impacts uh namia as i call him is a professor of civil engineering and a distinguished universal university scholar and a re Canadian research chair at the University of British Columbia a professional engineer dr bantia serves on the technical several committees of the indian uh, of the american concrete institutes and blah 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 uh he has been involved in a very important project with the uh, cleaning ganga and uh, i wish he gets involved in some infrastructure projects too with the help of some government agencies dr uh, bantia is an expert in the concrete industry he has got several us patents on his name and uh, at the moment he is in india for a private as well as a business uh, visit and there's a lot more to be said but i think i'll be wasting or taking away your time to le and le until we want to listen to him so please present dr bandia welcome him uh our president atul pandey will give his welcome address Good evening, friends. Uh, <clears throat> before coming here in the hall, I was sitting with my colleagues out there and uh, having an informal chat with Dr. Bandia. And uh, uh, we at VIA are uh, really privileged, in a way, that we are uh, having an opportunity to hear him for the second time. I was told that he has already been with us a couple of years back, and uh, unfortunately, I missed that. talk and uh, today it's it's my uh, good fortune to hear him uh, friends at uh, via we we did not only want to ensure that this platform is being used for facilitating speedy industrialization of this region but also for various developmental activities because they are all supportive to uh, the process of industrialization and uh, we must acknowledge the work done by Nagpur first we have had a wonderful event being organized uh, about two months back uh, where in uh, galaxy of speakers and uh, uh, the thought of thought process got ignited there uh, the churning of uh, you know various uh, synergies took place and uh, nice to see all these uh, developmental activities our loda ji is uh, spearheading this movement and uh, he is also a uh, integral part of uh, various vi activities he is chairman of our csr forum so it's a proud moment for all of us and uh, wishing uh, all the best and a belated wishing belated birthday to uh, honored guest this evening we look forward to hear him thank you uh i'll 
request uh, Mr. Pandey to uh, offer a floral bouquet to the speaker for the day uh, as a happy birthday <laughs> wish as well. <laughs> And I request uh, Mr. Bant uh, Dr. Bantia to come and uh, enlighten us for the day. Uh, sir, a photo you want to Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a real honor to be here today, uh, the second time. So, uh, President Atulji, thank you for those wonderful remarks. And to Shiraz, I like your blah, blah, blah. And those, the, that's the way that is the introduction should be always, I think. Just keep it short. Thank you very much. Hemanji, thank you again for your leadership here. And I really appreciate that. And Pez, thanks for organizing it. I know it was a short, short notice, but you certainly came through. So. I really, really appreciate that. Um, what I'd like to do, I think, is is, uh, is to give you a brief overview of uh, our center. Uh, I'm, of course, on the university side. I'm from the University of British Columbia. Uh, of course, an Akbar boy, uh, born and brought up and raised here. But it's been a journey, I think, and, and there's certainly some people here that have definitely helped the process of creating this center. It's a, it's a $50 million center at the moment, uh, working on collaborative uh, discoveries with India, with a number of institutions in India. And one gentleman and one uh, you know, uh, um, unstinting supporter I'd like to recognize is Mr. Renu here. Dajinder, you have always been very supportive of the center. You have always given us the right advice and the guidance. And whatever the center has become, I think it owes a great deal to you. So thank you so much. So uh, I will talk, I think, in context of uh, building smaller, smarter cities and healthier communities. That's kind of the tagline, but it's a bit more than that. And before I do that, I want to introduce this institution that has allowed me to do this. This is the place where I went to do my PhD. It's the University of British Columbia, which is on the western coast of Canada. It's a Pacific University. And it's a great school. It's the Canada's third largest university and a leader in research. So it's an extremely research intensive university. 18 faculties and 13 schools offer a wide range of study programs, one of the top schools in the country. It's got about 58,000 students now, so it's a huge school. Uh, certainly, whoever, uh, whenever you get an opportunity, do visit us. It's, uh, it's in one of the best cities in the world and perhaps Shiraz can perhaps attest to the fact that Vancouver is a good city to visit, and I think, Hemanji, you have been to Vancouver many times, I was told. So 58,000 students, 10,000 international students, $2 billion in operating revenue, operating budget at the moment, about half a billion in research funding. So it brings about $564 million in research funding. Seven Nobel Prize, uh, Prize winners actually on the campus right now. So at the moment, we have seven Nobel uh, Prize winners on our faculty at the moment, uh, and 31st in the Times Higher Learning Education, and we have actually now gone up to 21st now, so I think we are one of the top, twen top 25 schools in the world right now, so certainly I'm very proud to be actually involved with that. So the university uh, that I'm talking about hosts the center, and that's the center I want to describe to you, which is a Canada-India center. Uh, it's Canada India Research Center of Excellence, what it's called, and its short form is IC Impacts, and it's a long version. But the CT is actually Community Transformation in that Impact, which means that we are working towards changing uh, or transforming communities as we proceed in both Canada and India. And it's first in the only international network of centers of excellence actually in the world. 
So just to, as a brief reason of overview of why we call this a center of excellence or network of centers of excellence, uh, about 25 years ago, the Canadian government recognized that a lot of the research that we were performing in Canada was actually working on small pro problems, but it was not making a huge impact. Now, if you look at diabetes, for example, in diabetes, the world spends very close to four and a half billion dollars in diabetes research today. There are something like 4,300 people involved in diabetes research. Only problem is these 4,300 people working in diabetes are not working with each other. So if you really are working, looking at, you know, finding the cure for cancer or treatment for diabetes, Alzheimer's, mental diseases, uh, neurological disorders, you really need to work with each other. And this is our problem with research today. So the government said, well, listen, if you're solving these grand challenges, problems, diabetes, auto 21, uh, Alzheimer's, brain health, whatever, you need to actually create large centers. That's only when things will happen. That's only when people will work with each other and produce these ma major discoveries. That's when this network of centers of excellence idea was born. And the network of centers of excellence are large funding. So they have 18 universities involved. And they're given a large funding to essentially solve a problem. And in this particular case, we are, s we are a collaborative center with India, which is working in four different areas that I would talk about. Now, I serve as its scientific director and its CEO as well, along with my role as a professor at the university. And it's a different model, actually. And I know for Indians, for Indian context, it's a different model that a professor can also be a CEO at the same time of a center. And so this is a different model that we are looking at right now. Now, this center has actually been making a lot of noise, uh, uh, and rightfully so. And when Modi ji actually visited our center last year, he came to actually center. We had a wonderful meeting with him. And he then, in the end, when he, in his statement, joint statement, he particularly talked about our center. He said, this is the center. This is the way to operate. This is the way we can actually make a worldwide difference when India is not looking for aid anymore. Those days are gone. India is looking for collaborative opportunities with other countries. So let's solve problems together. Let's identify and let's work with each other in partnership mode rather than you know, India looking for aid from other countries. So this is actually a very good boost actually that gave our center is that Modi ji actually did mention our center actually in, 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 in the passing. Now we have a new prime minister in our country, uh, Justin Trudeau, and who has just been sworn in as our uh, uh, 21st prime minister of the country. And he also visited our center actually just very recently and he was just going into his first mandate as the Prime Minister, so I gave him a, a statue of Ganesh Ji there, I think you can see, which he really keeps in his office, I was told, because this was for auspicious beginnings, I think I gave him. So he, he quite enjoyed having this uh, nice little statue of Ganesh Ji. And he actually came to the center to look at some of the work was going on, and he said, well, look, this is the type of center, Naomi, we are really looking forward to actually supporting. So there's a huge amount of support now from both countries for our center. Where are we right now? And I'll talk about the actually what the center does. But we have 29 projects are funded. Our total funding is about $50 million. Uh, we have funded 29 projects. It has got 140 uh, strategic partnerships. It has got 12 patents already that we have actually um, been acquired. The center has acquired 12 patents in water treatment, infrastructure, and health on diagnostic side. And it's got 327 graduate students right now. So it's got 327 PhD and master's students working in the center right now on both sides, both in Canada and in India. And I personally, coming from the university, see that as that's our actual, uh, I would say, heritage of the center, that when, once we are gone, we're leaving these bright minds behind, which will take the, the torch forward, I think. So I'm really excited about having these 327 graduate students who are going to actually take the word forward and make a major difference. We have a lot of partners in this country, and you will notice uh, that's our uh, Minister of Science and Technology there. We just had a meeting. We signed an agreement with, uh, there's Uma Bhartiji there. We have an agreement with National Mission for Clean Ganga at the moment of transfer of technology.
then, of course, there is on the industrial side, uh, GMR. You'll see uh, signing with Reliance, for example, that's also participating in the center right now. And we just signed a major agreement with TCS on internet uh, monitoring of, of infrastructure. So that's sort of the kind of extent the center is actually doing. These are some of our uh, partners. You'll see a proud placement of Stevens there, Shiraz, as a partner of uh, our center. Uh, and, and, and this group is growing. We have about 43 industrial partners right now, including Tata's and Golder and Stantec and those kinds of companies. Now, for me, um, this partnership between industry and academia is extremely important. And if you look at really India, our biggest problem is that we are not creating intellectual property. We are not filing enough number of patents. And if you look at, in fact, the number of patents being filed per million inhabitants in the, in, the, in the country, India actually appears below Kenya, unfortunately. We are not filing enough number of patents in this country, which means that we are not actually having intellectual property, which can bring us funds back through licensing. We are not creating new products. We are actually borrowing technologies and knowledge from other countries, and that's not good for this country. We need to change that. And that can only change when researchers, such as the university researchers and industry, work together in order to produce technologies which are useful for the country. And that's where we really need to actually work together. And that's what the center believes in, that we really require that kind of movement here. And I was very happy to listen to Atulji when you were telling me that you have these three days of uh, you know, uh, essential uh, meeting of minds, I think, who can look at innovation and intellectual property and those kinds of things starting day after tomorrow. We need a lot more of that, I think, in the, in, in, in the country right now. So what does the center do? So we have four pillars. It has research and development. It does joint research between universities in Canada and India. Um, it does HQP and capacity building. So HQP is a highly qualified professional for us, which is our PhD and master students who are creating knowledge that will become the leaders of tomorrow. They will become entrepreneurs of tomorrow because they have the understanding and the knowledge. But it doesn't stop there. It's not about writing journal papers, which most university professors do, and I do as a professor as well. What we want to do is to actually take, the, take these research findings into communities. And I will show you a number of examples of where we have taken <coughs> water treatment facilities, infrastructure projects, into small communities, mid-sized communities, and towns. And I do actually remember starting with Nagpur. We were talking to Putimori Manufacturers Association in terms of really bringing some technologies forward. Now we have those technologies, and I'd like to restart that dialogue with Nagpur where is then opportunity to actually bring some of those technologies to this, to this particular city, perhaps in the smart, smart city context as well. Finally, we need industrial involvement. I think I invite, I mean, we are in the perfect location here. The Weather Industries Association is a great place, in fact, to, to invite the industry to work with the center, and we can, we can discuss you know, the, the, the available technologies in energy, in infrastructure, in water, in health, and we can talk about really how we can actually work with, each, with you from the industrial side to take some of these technologies into communities here. And, and, and these are available. You know, these are all publicly developed technologies, which means these technologies are available. And, and this is, in fact, something we invite you to actually look at. So what we do, these are the three core areas we are working in. One is in safe and sustainable infrastructure. As you know, India needs a lot of infrastructure integrated water management, and these are huge issues in India, as you know, in terms of water, uh, particularly wastewater and drinking water, and on the public health side. So let me t tell you a little bit about water, where we are. And you'll be shocked to learn, alarmed I would say, is that estimates reveal that by 2020, India's demand for water will exceed all sources of its supply. You would have no option but to desalinate. And we, need, we are heading towards that specific area. And India today becomes the most lucrative water market in the world. That's the most lucrative water market in the world is India right now. But we need have, we have issues. In the world, 1.1 billion people lack access to clean water. And that's actually, it's shameful for all of us. I think particularly as a civil engineer, I think which works in water treatment, this is absolutely shameful for us. You look at two and a half billion do not have access to adequate sanitation. 1.8 million children die 
by each other as a result of diarrhea. I think this is completely avoidable. Completely avoidable problem, I think. And there's no excuse for this. Fertilizer and pesticide runoff rapidly poisoning our water sources. I don't know how many of you know about this, but there is a belt called Malwa Belt in Punjab, which has become the cancer capital of the world. And that's exactly because of the fertilizer discharge into our drinking water. And that's a huge issue, actually, that we are not actually solving this problem of fertilizer coming into our water supply. It's a big, big, big issue. Up to 90% of wastewater in developed countries, or India particularly, flows in untreated into rivers, lakes, and coastal zones. What is your problem with national mission, uh, with Ganga at the moment? 80% of the raw sewage that's actually flowing into the, 80% uh, of the total pollution that's going into Ganga at the moment is raw sewage. 80%. Only 20% of it comes from industrial sources. 80% of it is just pure raw sewage flowing into that river. Completely inexcusable, I think, that you would allow the sewage to flow into a river we call the Holy River. Completely un you know, un unexcusable. And education and economic development is lost to sickness. If you're sick, you're not producing. You're not actually contributing to the world. Clearly, there's a real issue. So what are we doing within the center? This is our goal. What we're looking at is use of innovative sensors to more, reliab more reliable water quality monitoring. Now, when you have a problem with water, that you have E. coli or cryptosporidium and those kinds of things in water, you consume water, you know you'll be sick within eight hours. If you send your water out for testing, it takes up to 48 hours to get the results back, that the water, in fact, has E. coli or has cryptosporidium. What we are developing are these small sensors that can actually be inserted in water and they would immediately tell you that there is indeed a water pollution. And it works on pathogens and it works on arsenic and it works on all kinds of different chemicals. So both the biological load and the chemical load can be detected by simple instrument which has a digital readout. So it has a digital readout which can then be con you know, essentially placed through an ICD platform into your internet network and you can monitor the water quality in the entire city. And immediately, I, if I have one location where there is some breach, if some E. coli, some sewage, some cryptosporidium has come into water, I would see somewhere on a, a, a network that, in fact, there is a breach somewhere in the city somewhere. But again, that's a very powerful model, I believe, in protecting you know, problems with our contaminated water. We are developing alternate power sources. I'll talk about the energy side. Many places in India don't have power for water treatment. They're off the grid completely. About 250 million people don't have grid power here in this country. And that's the entire population of the United States, by the way. And we need to actually solve that. So if you need water treatment, you actually need to have water treatment on off-grid power. It's absolutely a requirement. Otherwise, you'll never have that. And finally, we are creating novel water treatment systems for safer drinking water, which means we need cost-effective water treatment facilities which will allow us to do that. On the public health side, it's a here real issue. So in, in India, maternal deaths are the highest. 1.4 million infants die from malnutrition and lack of immunization every year. Vaccination is very important in this country. And vaccinations actually require uh, power because you have to preserve these vaccines at a low temperature. Otherwise, they, they get spoiled if you're actually delivering that vaccines which has stayed in, you know, even more than, more than 30 minutes in 50 degrees Celsius, you have lost effectiveness there. So Bill Gates Foundation, which is working with this, we're developing these small uh, refrigeration units which actually work completely off, off the shelf, off-grid power on solar power, for example. Which, so you can take these vaccines into small towns, which doesn't have power, has no refrigeration, and you can still be administering these vaccines to small children. So it's a real issue, actually. India's infectious disease burden in malaria, HIV, STI, which is sexually transmitted infections, is staggering. Two million cases of tuberculosis alone each year. And that, I believe, is completely inexcusable as, a world, as, as the World Health Organization has predicted. So what are we doing? We're looking at new technologies for rapid diagnostics of the infections and water-related infections in India and Canada. We're focusing on maternal and child health. And we are looking at developed development of uh, mobile networked health technologies. India has one billion cell phones. This is a very powerful model, I think, for mobile technologies and mobile health delivery in this country. If you have a problem, have go to an app, look at the symptoms, feed your symptoms, and you would immediately be getting some treatment from a 
treatment from a specialist in some wonderful place. So for example, there's this uh, project going on in, in Bangalore right now. So we're developing for this very simple eye testing device, which is portable. It can be taken to small, small uh, villages. It, it's a very portable device. You can check the eyesight of people and deposit the data through a cloud uh, server or onto a cloud server through cloud, you know, outsourcing or cloud sourcing. And you can actually get these data being examined by a real specialist somewhere in Delhi, for example. Also and that's a powerful model because you can do not have access to specialists in these small towns, but if it's actually done through a cloud server, these specialists can look at those scans, they look at these sort of the retinal scans or, or corneal scans and come up with really how to actually fix these problems immediately. And that's actually is a very powerful role and that these uh, mobile technologies can play. Now I want to talk about infrastructure. And I'm from Rajasthan, so I've got this wonderful elephant from Rajasthan here. And there's a reason why I'm showing you an elephant. See, we just found out that the elephants actually run with their front legs. So the, the rear legs of the elephant simply drag on. I don't know how many of you knew that, but anyway, it's a biological fact. The elephant always runs on its front legs. And India is very similar. If you look at its celebrated services, like services, telecoms, outsourcing, technology, uh, IT, for example, these are the front legs. And what's actually dragging behind in this particular case of the elephant is our infrastructure and our agriculture. So we really require a great deal of actual support for our infrastructure, heavy industries and agriculture, which are literally dragging behind these emphasis type you know, industries that are just bringing a lot of cash into the country. That's why we're focusing a lot on our IT industry and much less on the infrastructure and much less on the heavy industries, which are not actually bringing as much cash because these are services we utilize. So really, we need a lot of work done on infrastructure in this country. So what are we doing? If you look at now the conditions here, aging infrastructure with unknown condition both in Canada and India, 125 billion Can Canadian present infrastructure crisis. We have a big problem in Canada as well. So if you look at this that freeway, oh sorry, this overpass that collapsed in Canada uh, in, uh, just a couple of years ago just killed eight people. This is in just not too far from Montreal, which is where this overpass collapsed. This overpass was actually inspected the same week it collapsed. And that is a possible concern because if we are actually having a structure collapse the same week as was inspected, that tells us that in fact we don't know how to inspect these structures. And that's a similar problem in India. You have no idea what condition these structures are in, particularly if you look at the bridge just now here, not too far from Nagpur, by the way, that bridge I'm showing you here. Look at how the bearings have completely shifted from its place. This is an unsafe bridge. This is an unsafe bridge. And you really require method, methods of actually monitoring this. But here comes the concept of smart cities. Your smart city should have sensors on a structure like this which will tell you that the bridge is now unsafe. That is a smart city for me. And you re really require these kinds of sensors and etc. So what are we doing? We are actually looking, and India now as you know will spend 1.3 trillion in five years, next five years on infrastructure, mostly PPP model for example. Use of innovative sensors for more accurate structural health monitoring. I should be able to tell what stage my, my thermal power plant is. I should be able to tell what stage my bridges are in. I should be able to tell what stage my nuclear power plants are, etc. And new technologies for repairing, strengthening existing structures. When you realize that there is a problem, we have, we have an issue and we can fix this. Water storage infrastructure is a big problem here, actually. So India can store only up to 30 days of rainfall compared to 900 days in major river basins in arid regions of developed countries. We don't have a lot of stored water in this country and you really require a very large water storage infrastructure. Supply infrastructure is just as bad. Supply infrastructure is completely corroded here, and, you and that's what causes these, uh, these breaches where all the sewage actually gets into your drinking water, and there's a lot of intermixing that goes on, which makes a lot of people sick. And I think there are massive uh, investment needed in the water infrastructure in this country alone. Energy. And this is the last area we are in. 1.2 billion people in the world do not have power. Many more only have access for a few hours a day. Problem is far more acute in rural areas. Needless misery left behind to live in the 19th century life. This is a 
fact i think it's